afternoon everyone. Um, as you've heard, uh, I'm going to be presenting work that's done um, at Ulster University with myself, Dr John McCord, Dr Lucy Royal Dawson and Dr Eleanor Kirk and we're all in the room among you. Uh, hoping to get some good feedback on our research. This is a, coming towards the end of a two and a half year project that's funded by the Nuffield Foundation, looking at litigants in person in the Northern Ireland civil and family justice system. And uh, we're looking in particular at the issue of participation and two reasons for that. The first is that this flows from work that we did um, with tribunal users uh, for the Law Centre back in 2010 that looked at how tribunal users participated in their dispute resolution systems and drawing from that the idea of legal participation as a concept and how do people engage with dispute resolution and transferring that to the courts. And then this project looks very specifically at how people who go to court without a lawyer participate directly in their hearings and what the potential barriers to that participation might be. So that's the first reason for looking at participation. The second is because we do this in collaboration with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and Sarah Donnelly from the Commission is here as well. Um, and participation is, is a core part of access to justice, but it's more fundamental than that. It goes to the heart of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which talks about the right to a fair trial. Uh, the right to a fair trial, of course, doesn't include the right to legal representation, and so there is a right to a fair trial where you're not represented, and the core of that uh, right rests with the idea of effective participation. So we're very keen to understand how litigants participate in the legal system, how they understand participation, and, and what the barriers to that participation uh, are. So this is um, a presentation of qualitative research, primarily, but the the context that we have is that this is the picture of litigants in the civil and family court system um, whose cases were disposed between 2012 and 2016. So the top line represents all of the cases that were disposed, and cases that are disposed are cases that have come through the system and come out the other end. And there are, between 2012 and 2016, we've gone from about 95,000 cases to about 75,000 cases. The black, solid black line that you see beneath that is the, percent, is the um, disposed cases of litigants in person in civil and family justice. And that sits, uh, not very clear, but it's, it sits around 19,000. It's dropped to around uh, 17,000, so it's pretty steady. But that includes um, small claims cases. Small claims make up the largest proportion of litigants in person in the civil and family justice system. We didn't look at small claims in our study, uh, in part because there's a a sense that small claims can cope with litigants in person in a way that other parts of the justice system don't seem to be able to. So our study represents this bottom line, this dotted line, which is fairly constant from 2012 to 2016 at around 4,500 to 5,000 disposed cases per year. That's about 5, 5.5% of that litigant population. So 5.5% of that total litigant population doesn't seem like a lot. It certainly doesn't indicate that there's um, a lack of appetite for legal representation, but it does represent four, four and a half thousand, five thousand people's experiences per year. So it's not something that we can ignore. And so what we've done in our research is primarily a qualitative study, interviewing 179 litigants in person, talking to 60 court actors, so that's judges, solicitors, barristers, court service staff, um, Mackenzie Friends, Children's Court officers, and trying to get a holistic view of their experiences. And I want to take you through uh, the experiences of one of our personal litigants. We'll call her Jane. Uh, she's fairly atypical. Um, she's probably got a profile quite like the profile of lots of people in this room. She's educated, highly educated. She's a professional. She works full time. Um, she's above degree level um, uh, qualification. She has a child, she's a single parent, she's split from her husband after a difficult relationship. Um, she's highly articulate, highly capable, very high emotional intelligence, very high intellectual intelligence. So very able to manage her own affairs and very able to, uh, to determine what it is that she needs and what her child needs. So we met Jane uh, as she was going through the system. She was in the system for about a year and just over a year with this case. She had no one single reason for self-representing, which is common among our cohort, um, but uh, there are multiple reasons for individuals to self-represent. So in Jane's case, she had had a legal representative, she'd had a solicitor, and she expressed no dissatisfaction with that solicitor, but uh, her ex-partner, who was initiating the proceedings, uh, there were contact proceedings about the child, um, had no representation, and so Jane felt that her solicitor was spending the time informing the other side about what was happening in the case, and she didn't feel that that was 
particularly helpful for her. The costs then became too much for her, so she couldn't afford to retain the, the services of the solicitor. And as well as that, she was working full time, she was a mother, she didn't have time to go to solicitor's appointments. So she decided she would take the case uh, herself. And through the, the um, course of the hearings, she identified information, um, procedural and emotional barriers that she faced in participating in those hearings. So information barriers. She was very well aware of what she needed to do. She was very well aware of the need to prepare and she was very well aware of her lack of self-knowledge, but found it very difficult to access information that would assist her. So she talks about being, it being incredibly difficult, like finding a needle in a haystack. She talks about the information on the court website where lots of litigants in person get referred to uh, just automatically. But she evaluated the information there. She found it to be very limited and very difficult to navigate. And she felt that the information that went out with the summons was came with an expectation that you would understand this language, you would understand what this letter meant. So there was a notion of a legal background that was there. And bearing in mind, this is a professional working woman, very much like people in this audience, very much um, cap very capable of reading um, complex information. Procedural barriers, she found, in her case, because it ran over for uh, quite a long period of time, she ended up with four successive judges hearing the case. And that was very off-putting for her, very unsettling. She didn't really know how to handle the different styles of the judges, didn't know what each, each of them had done previously, didn't know whether, how much they'd read the file, didn't know how much attention to detail that they'd uh, shown. Um, so she didn't know whether to do things like recall past orders that had been made either in that case or in previous litigation. And she had a sense that she couldn't really communicate or convey uh, what she wanted to say in court. Um, she talked about getting cut short and not having the opportunity to share information. Again, a very articulate woman and not you know, very able to speak for herself. Her big concern, and we saw this with a lot of litigants, was a fear of irritating the judge. The judge is going to make a decision in your case and you don't want to get on the wrong side of them. So you don't want to push it, you want to get the information out, but you don't really know how to do it. So she talked about that as being a major challenge, um, that part of the role that a solicitor would normally play to jog the judge's memory. How far could she push that? How far could she do that? And yet there were clearly times when she felt that there was a need to do that because judges didn't seem to recall what previous judges had directed. Uh, in terms of uh, cross-examination, the, there was a children's court officer involved to look at contact and she wasn't sure what the status of that uh, engagement was. Could she cross-examine? Had she a right to cross-examine? How did that happen? When would the opportunity arise? And as it happened, the opportunity didn't appear to arise and so she was kind of left high and dry on that point. So those procedural barriers, again, although she's an atypical uh, litigant, quite common issues there that are, that are coming up uh, in the study. And emotionally, she talked about the emotional barriers. She said, I was reasonably confident during the first few months. I kind of felt as if there was a lot more scope to be heard in relation to some of the concerns that I had. But it hit a certain point after a few months, and I feel quite despondent going in. So this is a very capable woman who just hits a wall, and now it becomes this thing that she's despondent about, not a thing that she's actively participating in to the same extent. When we... Um, surveyed the uh, litigants in person who we talked to, we did a what's called a GHQ12 survey, a general health questionnaire uh, with 12 questions on it, which is a standard assessment to assess uh, potential psychiatric morbidity or potential um, symptoms of mental ill health. If you have a score of four or more on the GHQ12, then that indicates that you may have propensity towards <coughs> mental ill health at that point in time. This um, Jane score here was three, so there was no indication that she had mental ill health, and yet even at her level, she was experiencing emotional barriers that were there. Our GHQ score 12 for the, um, for the, for the population that we looked at, 58% of our litigants in person had a, a GHQ score 12 of more than four, which compares to about 17% of the general population. So there are issues there around um, litigation, mental health, and litigating in person. So we asked Jane what would make things better, what would help? Three things. First of all, emotional support. It would certainly help because representing yourself, you're trying to set aside any personal impact that you have. So you're two things. You're both your own solicitor, but you're your own client as well. And that's a difficult act for anyone to balance, no matter how <laughs> capable uh, you are. Um, she talked about explaining the process of the case to her. This seems perfectly obvious. Um, the process of the case hasn't been explained. It's just show up at the next one. I'm quite surprised that we're still here a year later. So nobody ever says, oh, at the next hearing, this is what we'll do. There's an expectation of knowledge that's already there, and nobody takes the time really to explain it. And then thirdly, and probably most critically, there could be a lot more information available on the website. And the idea that there would be somebody to go to, somebody who you could navigate to, so not just information, but a person who could support, who would answer questions, a point of contact. 
And again, that comes through very, very clearly in our, um, in our findings. So that's the experience of the litigant in person, the holistic experience that we looked at in relation to the court. The biggest challenge is that litigants in person represent a challenge to the norm. The norm of the court system is it's an adversarial process. Lawyers, qualified lawyers, represent the legal facts, the legal opinions, uh, the law to the judge who then adjudicates on those issues. Whoever comes into that arena has to fit into that arena, it seems, and they don't. They are outsiders. They're recognised as outsiders. They feel like they're outsiders, and they are there as an irritation, effectively, in the system. So they breached that norm, and that was a substantive finding that we made, that, that there was a huge resentment on the part of those within the system, and there was a huge resentment on those who were outside the system as being treated like outsiders. So one legal representative said, just everything is just ruined by a personal litigant. So it was fairly typical, quite um, well put. Um, whereas the personal litigant is objecting to the idea that, um, you know, people are being disrespectful to this individual because they're not replying, they're not responding, they're not treating them as, an, as a co-equal, they're not treating them in the same way that they would another solicitor. They have no engagement with that individual because they are not part of the system, they're pushed outside it and treated as an outsider. So that challenge to the norm is really substantive and we need to address that. We're not the first people to have said this, but that has to change. Lots of issues around the time that it takes, so a lot of um, discussion around the efficiency of the court and it being a, a false economy for lawyers uh, not to be um, instructed because it takes the court system longer to go through the cases. We didn't compare um, the, the length of time of LIP proceedings with fully represented cases, but court actors certainly reported that they take longer. And this was the idea that judges take time to explain things. So a five minute adjournment might take 15 minutes and that all adds up every day. So that was an issue that was, um, was raised uh, with us. But the idea of judges being the people who facilitate that understanding of the court system, there's quite a bit of tension there with judges. So the idea that we would switch to an inquisitorial system is not something that we're advocating. We never evaluated what an inquisitorial system would look like. But we did try to evaluate what more inquisitorial approaches would look like from individual judges. But judges are quite split on this. So the first judge, Judge 07, talks about it's not our role. If, if parties don't bring the issues to us, it's not our role to go and find the issues for them. We adjudicate on what the parties bring to us, whether they're represented or not. Contrasting quite strongly with Judge 11, who says, well, inevitably, you do become more inquisitorial. You do get in the arena. You do find out what needs to be done. And that lack of consistency across different business areas, but also within the same business area, comes across to personal litigants and is something that we do need to address within the context of respecting the autonomy of judges. So that's something that we have to um, consider in terms of impact. LIPs, you don't turn up. So if you're um, instructing a solicitor or a barrister, you can say, well, I can't be here that day, so you'll be here on my behalf. But if you're a litigant in person, you've got to be there, and you've got to be there at every hearing. And that can be a problem, can be a problem for the courts, because litigants don't always turn up. It can be a real problem for litigants in person, because there's no systematic way of letting them know. We saw in Jane's case, uh, her solicitor was the one who was tasked with letting the other side know. But had she not had a solicitor, how does the other party find out? So no systematic way of getting information and a real problem that we observed with evidence being presented that could have a fundamental impact on the case that the litigant in person wasn't there to rebut or to test or to make sure was, uh, was thorough. Children's court officers were also involved heavily in LIP cases. The judges tended to rely on them quite a lot in terms of being able to direct a neutral re report on contact proceedings. But this neutrality seemed to bleed into that kind of intermediary role. So there was a concern there that, that children's court officers were being um, compromised in their neutrality by being asked to, to engage with the other side and explain things to them. Mackenzie Friends, very contentious. Um, and yet what we found was lots of judges, not all of them, but lots of judges in particular, saw the value in having Mackenzie Friends, saw the support that they brought and saw that a good Mackenzie Friend can do a really good job. The difficulty is that there's no conformity in how they are uh, permitted entry to the court and there's no means of assessing their value. So you can have you know, really um, vulnerable, vulnerable individuals who are being preyed on or you can have really vulnerable in individuals who have been well supported and we don't know how to measure or evaluate that. This is our overall recommendation. We won't go into the detail of the um, individual recommendations that we're still working through at the moment, but the, the overall recommendation is that the system needs to change. We need to reorient the system towards personal litigants. They're there. They've always been there. They're not going to go away. They have to be accommodated, and we have to accommodate them by including them in the redesign process. So it's not enough for us to just say, 
oh, we should do this. We need to involve litigants in person, get their perspective, understand what works for them, understand that there isn't one single solution that will work for them and we need to work across the piece. What we're saying is not particularly new or startling. This is well-raked ground. We had the strategy for access to justice um, in 2015 where the recommendation was very clear. We need to stop seeing litigants in person as a problem for the justice system. They are the users of the justice system. They are the litigants in the justice system who need to be accommodated. And we need to stop treating them as outsiders. Um, and so the recommendation there that there should be uh, support and uh, an action plan to deliver help for them. The um, family justice and civil justice recommendations that reported under Justice Gillen last year, again, the same things here, lots of issues around case management, lots of references to how the judges should behave with the litigants in person setting out, set out in the Equal Treatment Bench book, consideration of being more inquisitorial, how do judges feel about that, how can we get some consistency around that, more and better information, that's the clearest thing that we find, simplification of language, it's impossible for people to understand some of the instructions and some of the everyday parlance of, of courts, a central hub for information, training for court staff, court appointed mediators, and finally, something at least that we can tick the box on, collect more data about LIPs. This is a hugely robust study and there is a huge amount of information that we have brought to this. But we need to understand that change has to happen and change needs to happen not just to make the system more tolerable, not just to make it more tolerable for those court actors or those litigants, but because it's part of access to justice, because it's part of a fundamental right of a litigant to have access to justice, to have access to a fair trial. The Recommendations we're drilling down on at the moment, we're meeting our external advisory group tomorrow. Um, no doubt that will be a fun meeting where we get to hear everybody's views and what we're going to recommend. And then we will report the uh, final uh, findings and recommendations at a conference in uh, September, which you're all warmly invited to. Okay, thank you.